Hi, I'm Eric Ostro, host of Live at the Lord Town. For season three, we are focusing on the intersection of arts and advocacy. So many off-Broadway artists give back to their communities. This season, we are giving them the opportunity to speak about how and why they chose the causes they devote themselves to and how those causes help make them the people and artists they are today. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you and to introduce to you my lovely, lovely co-host, Anne. And come on into the space. Yes, Anne James, we are so happy to have you here. How are you today? I, you know what? I couldn't be better, Joy. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm in a good mood. It's a little cloudy here in LA, which I love, and uh, you know, trying to live my best life. How about you? Yes. I'm doing well. Thank you so much, and I'm excited about having Shannon on today, I and know. Um, and I'm excited about um, all her organizations and all that sort of stuff. So I want to just jump right in. Okay, Go so for it. welcome everyone. We have Shannon Tayo here, who was born in South Korea and adopted and raised in Rochester, New York. She recently received the Lucille Lortel Award for Outstanding Lead Performer in a play for her performance in Mayi Theater Company's production of The Chinese Lady at the Public Theater. Shannon won the 2021 Sovas Society of Voice Arts and Sciences Award in the audiobook narr narration Teens best voiceover category for her narration of The Girl from the Sea by Molly Knox Ostertag. Shannon received her BFA from Syracuse University and is an advocate for Also Known As, whose mission is to empower the voice of adult international adoptees, build cultural bridges, transform perceptions of race, and acknowledge the loss of the birth country culture, language, and biological family experienced by international adoptees. It is with my great pleasure that I would love to present to you Shannon Tayo. Hello. Nice hey. to see you. Uh, we, we hear you, but we... The, we almost see you. Uh oh. <laughs> You're a disembodied voice. That's all right. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm sure your camera will come on in just a second. Okay. Yeah, it will. It will. Um, so yeah. while we're ho while we're holding for that, Shannon, tell me how are you today? I'm pretty good. I'm worried about my Wi-Fi connection, but other than that, everything's going well. Okay. Are you calling in from Rochester? No, I'm in. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn, actually. I'm in Crown Heights. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. Where are you? Where are you, Joy? I'm I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. And as am I. Nice. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles for now. I'm headed your way. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be headed your way in next week. Oh, my goodness. Very nice. It is muggy and summer here for sure. So get ready. Well, yeah, fantastic. Excellent. So I've been told that you all can see Shannon. I just can't see her. And can you see her? No. Nope. Okay. So, Not important. I, gorgeous person. <laughs> <laughs> gorgeous. So Shannon, what a wonderful, wonderful um, accomplishment you've made with your career and your recent nomination for a Lucille Lortel Award. Can you tell us a little bit about the Chinese lady? There you are. I see you now. All right. Hi. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the Chinese lady, um, it's written by... Um, wonderful writer, good friend of mine, Lloyd Se. Um, I started with the production in 2018, um, and we sort of maintained the, the team as we move forward through the years. So uh, I started doing it. The other actor in the show, Daniel K. Isaac, and I have done, um, have done it for years together, and he's now, he's truly like my brother. Um, so uh, so that's, that was a wonderful journey with him. Um, we started at uh, Barrington Stage Company, uh, and then we moved really quickly to New York City. We did it at Theater Row for, I mean, just about two weeks, maybe a little under two weeks. And then there had always been talks about uh, doing a longer run in New York City. And then, you know, COVID happened, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then we finally made our way to the public. And um, yeah, we finished the run, I guess, about a month ago at this point. When you started the show, did you have any idea that all of this would start happening for you? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, no. Um, and I still don't really understand. I, I mean, I, uh, at the Lord tells, like I, um, when I won the award, it truly, I mean, this in like a, in not like a terrible sense, but it truly was like a nightmare sort of like out of body situation where, you know, those dreams where you're just like, you're somewhere and you don't have pants on or something. It felt like that. It felt like <laughs> just a surreal experience. Um, I just knew that I really loved the play. I, at the time I had received the script, I was just personally taking a super deep dive into Asian American history. And then to receive this script, I remember standing in the kitchen of my best friend's apartment and, and telling her the entire, uh, the entire script, like just, I was so excited to be able to even audition for it. Um, and then when I got it, it was, it was amazing because it was everything that I really, uh, that I wanted to say. And this, and, and Lloyd had written it so beautifully. So it was just really, it was really good timing on like a personal level. Um, as a young artist, was this your first time being able to take a deep dive into something that was you felt as though you were culturally connected to? Because I know that typically um, a lot of times when we are um, working as artists, we're asked to step outside of our own cultural experience and kind of embrace a universal experience. But this was very specific. Was this your first time being able to do that? Or have you had this experience before? That's an interesting question. Yes and no, I guess, because I started off doing um, pretty much exclusively musical theater when I first got out of college. And it's a very complicated thing to say now, but I will say like my first professional equity job was doing a production of Miss Saigon. And that is, <laughs> it's a loaded thing to say now, but I gotta be honest with you, when I was growing up, that was the only, that was my goal. You know what I mean? Like I, in my head, I was like, that's as good as it gets. Like there's nothing that is so um, challenging and, and it's such a big part. And for someone who looks like me, I'm like, that that is it. That is that is the pinnacle. Um, well, so and I wasn't remember, that Leah Salonga who just, yeah. I mean, queen, queen. Totally. I mean, gold. yes. After goals. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I remember, you know, like being in my bedroom and I had a little flashlight that I used to like, and do all the dramatic scenes and you know what I mean like <laughs> so um but inside of that it's really interesting because especially in like the Asian American actor theater community and the, within like the Asian American diaspora in general like I think I'm not stepping out of bounds I think the Filipino community will back me up here that most of the time if you're going to do Miss Saigon it's like 75 percent Filipinos right um <laughs> with love. I say that with like yes. gratitude and love. Um, so I, so I am a transracial adoptee. So that means that um, the family that I was raised by is a white family. And so sort of like being in Miss Saigon was my first time sort of being totally enveloped by other Asian Americans. And that was like a really special experience as well as the show. Like I look back on the show now and it's really complicated, obviously. Um, but I am, but I am, I am grateful for the experience of that and the opportunity to, um, as complicated as like Miss Saigon is, it did make me feel some, it, it was like being celebrated for being Asian in a way that I hadn't experienced before. So it, did, it was special and it was meaningful to me, despite like all the problems with it, to be honest. Um, so anyway, flashing forward to, to Chinese lady, I'm not, I'm not culturally or ethnically Chinese. I am, I did a DNA test and I'm, I'm mostly Korean and I'm like one third Japanese. And I don't know where or how any of that comes by. Cause I, I don't know any of my biological family. Um, but the experience inside of Chinese lady, the only reason I felt comfortable like taking it on in particular is because what I connected to, what I really connected to with the part was, um, I think Ah Fong's journey inside of the play is very similar actually to what it means to be uh, an adoptee because she was, she was brought to the States willingly. Everybody understood everything that was involved in the transaction of it and then sort of lived in isolation. And you could watch her journey. To me, what I connected with was watching her journey um, both away from her culture and then and then trying to find her way back to her culture, mm -hmm. sort of on her own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And That's, now, 
Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, and no, no, no. Go I ahead. was going to say, now you are, uh, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're going to get the opportunity to direct the show. <laughs> Is that right? I Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm leaving so in about a week us, for that. Tell us, tell us about what you're looking forward to in investigating the play on that side of the table. Yeah, uh, I'm so excited. Um, well, my uh, the director who was working with us and, and the artistic director of Magi, Ralph Pena, very, very dear to my heart and both personally and professionally. Um, he, I had, I had posited this to him that, that I was like, Ralph, these people are asking, you know, like there had been another production that had asked me to potentially direct. And I was like, Ralph, it happened again. Like somebody else wants me to direct this. And he was like, you know, this is a good opportunity for you to, to, do, to do all the things I would never let you do. And I was like, all right. <laughs> Um, and I think Ra what Ralph did was brilliant. And also I'm just looking forward to um, what I would say is like adjusting small uh, moments of, of tone. Um, because uh, even from 2018 to 2022, the world is very different and the climate around um, the, around like Asian American history in particular is so different now. And especially like, you know, we were doing the show in, January and February of 2022 at sort of what I would perceive to be like the height of, of, or anyway, in, in my body, it, it felt like the height of um, crimes against the Asian American community or like the visibility, we should say, of the crimes against the Asian American community. Um, so I could just, I could feel the difference even between those years. And I feel the difference even between February and now. Um, and, I, and I'm looking forward to, in the production that we're putting up at Adirondack Theater Festival, to really getting into um, strength, mm. St like st true strength, because there was, a, there was a period of time in February where I felt like the messaging was, <laughs> if I step outside in my body, I'm going to get stabbed in the throat. Like, you better mm. watch out. Like, everybody is, you know, and it was real. Like, the feeling of danger is real. But what I ultimately needed was not everybody saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. I needed somebody to say, like, you're going to be fine. Mm. You're going to be fine. Yeah. You're a strong yeah. person. If things happen, they will happen. You will handle it. You are a strong person. You can you can go outside. You can go outside. It's okay. You can go on the subway. The subway is a mess anyway. It's a mess for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. the world is a mess for everybody. And you can go outside. Everybody's you're going to be fine. Mm. Even if it was a lie, it's just what I really needed to hear. So I just was repeatedly telling myself that like it's it's okay. It's okay. Mm. <laughs> well, I strength to you. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I hope that the people that are listening that could use that, that that deposits mm -hmm. into their spirit as well, because at this time, everybody who's feeling very vulnerable needs to have that as a mantra that it's OK and I can go outside and I will be safe. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's mm -hmm. a that's a personal note right there for everybody listening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, when you talked about um, the, the tone of the show. Um, we have a lot of young people that are listening and it's it's wonderful to have you on as a young um, performer as well. I'm but not there's that oftentimes, young. Right? <laughs> but there's oftentimes we have a lot of people who are younger who are still in school. Sure, sure, sure. Um, tell us about your approach to directing. Tell us about um, what are some of the first things that you do in preparation for it and making that shift from actor to director. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, at this point, this is my first time directing. So all I'm trying to do at this point is go slow, be transparent, um, communicate as best I can. Um, and then I'm so lucky that this is the first show that I get to direct because I do know it inside out, forwards, backwards. Um, so the interesting thing for me, I guess, for this show is, is um, because I've been doing it for so long, and I'm trying to think of, oh, what's it called? When when you repeat a word so many times, it just loses all sense of meaning. Um, semantic satiation, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Um, and uh, so there's times when, uh, as I'm going back over the script, it's it's a great opportunity to sort of peel everything back and just look at the words. Just look at exactly what the text is saying, as opposed to like, you know, me in my head, like thinking, all right, here comes this like cue, and I got to make sure I hit this angle, and we're moving forward to this. 
piece of blocking or whatever the case may be from inside the show. Um, so it's been a wonderful time, yeah, to return to the scripts. And especially, you know, I feel like everybody says this, but when the material is good, it's it's just like, just do what's on the page. The man had an, a good idea, just do the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess preparation wise, it's just um, I'm just trying to think through all the possible scenarios um, because I feel like as a director, I, you know, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say who the actors are going to be. So I'm not going to say anything right now. But suffice it to say, they're really wonderful. And I feel like my job will be just to make sure they have everything they need, more or less to manage the personalities in the room and to be able and to be there to just sort of put out fires as they as they light, <laughs> you know, um, and that's that's what I have experienced with um, my favorite directors. I'm going to shout out one of my favorite directors, Summer L. Williams. Um, she used to do this thing at the beginning of rehearsal where we would stand in a circle and she would like hold her hand out like this. And she'd be like, put put your problems here. What's wrong? Like, what do, mm. what do you feel today? Like, mm. give it to me. And I remember that so clearly. I'm going to text her and tell her that I'm going to use that in rehearsal. <laughs> That's um, nice. But it was just comforting. It was just like, oh, someone's, I, you know, as an actor, you're asked to, you know, everyone is at work, right? And everyone's being asked to like give of themselves. But it was, it was so comforting to just visibly see that like, oh, someone has a place for me to put my worries. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can beautiful. just be free while you're in that yeah. space. Yeah. It's very nice. So yeah. you've gone from Lucille Lortel to also the Sovas. What yeah. was that like being that recognized? Was, that was great. Um, I started doing a lot of voiceover work during the pandemic, like everybody else. Um, and that was my first sort of like official uh, audio book. And it was actually a graphic novel. So it was um, myself and like many other characters, sort of like a radio play. Um, but I really love Jennifer, Jennifer Chan is not alone. That's a different book. That was okay. just me doing solo narration. Um, okay. this one was a group of people and, okay. uh, it was a beautiful, it was, it's a beautiful book. I really like graphic novels as well. Um, it was just a beautiful story and it was like a queer sort of YA story too, which I, as a queer person, like I'm, I'm always very into the idea that like, you know, kids these days, kids these days have such a wonderful, um, resources. So anytime I'm doing like a YA book, I am reading it and just thinking like, oh man, kids these days are so, they're so lucky to like have this, have these things in front of them. Um, it makes me so happy to just be able to be like, here, take it. <laughs> <laughs> and bringing your Asian voice to that story speaks a lot to the diversity that is, I think, a lot easier in the audiobook world. Can you tell us a little bit about what it felt like to voice these these moments and these characters as 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 an Asian woman, and you know what you felt you left left behind there for for everyone to witness? Yeah, it's really strange sometimes. I think with um, voiceover work for Asian American people. Because sometimes <laughs> I just wonder, I, I, I appreciate the fact that they are very diligent about matching, like this must be an Asian person, but you can't, I'm not like noticeably speaking any different than an, like an American person would. Um, and I always have this thought about uh, just like, how are Asian Americans supposed to sound? How am I supposed to sound? Mm. I had in, in college, uh, and again, this was, I'm 35 years old, so this was like a while ago. But when I was in college, I remember having a teacher say, you have to, you know, in order to work, you should learn to sound like you look. And I was like, I think I sound like I look. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was like a different time. I'm hoping that person wouldn't say that anymore. But I understood what they meant. Like fundamentally, I remember uh, one of the first jobs I got, I'm not going to say on what TV show, but it was a small part. And they asked me to come in and read this one line or whatever. And they're like, just because it's zany, just because it's zany, can you do it with an accent? And I had no problem at that point in time. I was like, I just want this. I just want this job. Um, you did a French accent. I did a full <laughs> French accent, <laughs> a German accent. Yeah. I should have. Oh, man. I wasn't smart enough then. <laughs> yeah, just specify. Well, hopefully yeah. it's better for the, the next generation because – you you got um can you do it in an accent 
when I was younger, I just flat out got, can you be blacker? Of course. Yeah. So yeah. just yeah. flat out. Sassy. So, can you sass yeah. it up? Yeah. Oh, and my go-to for all the young people listening is when you hear things like that, just how do you mean? Yeah, of course. Of course. And let Clarify, them please. work through trying to, and then once they try and give you a description, say, can you do it for me, please? <laughs> <laughs> and that Incredible. just it nips it right in the butt. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible advice. Yeah. So as a young person um, who was an adoptee, you are, um, are you an advocate for this organization or are you, is it, are you one of the founders of also known mm -hmm. as tell us about your relationship with it? Yeah. Uh, I'm not an, I'm not a founding member. I, I honestly, um, it's just, I am part of their membership and i um, as I was sort of like, you know, going through the questionnaire for this episode, um, it was the first it was the first organization that sprung to mind um, because I think there are a lot of other organizations as well that are for adult adoptees um, to amplify adult adoptee voices that I would love to like shout out if we get a second later on. Um, but the beautiful thing about the organization is it is a place for um the adoption narrative in general, and I'm going to speak specifically when I'm going to clarify this for sure. When I'm speaking of adoption overall, what I'm speaking of is is um, transnational, predominantly transracial adoption. I think like domestic adoption and uh, adoption through foster care is an entirely different system that I am not super familiar with. This is the one I, you know, there are, I don't know the exact number at this point, but I'm going to say it's somewhere between 250,000 and 300,000 uh, Korean adoptees worldwide. So there, there's that many people who have been sent overseas because it was very organized. It was just an or, a very organized system. So there are so many Korean adoptees. Um, there's so many Korean adoptees in the arts. <laughs> if you ever see a Korean looking person with just like a sort of generic European last name, I'm like, that, that like probably that person is adopted. Um, my last name is a French Canadian name that just happens to look vaguely Asian. So I sort of get away with it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so also known as is just a really wonderful organization. It is predominantly Korean American adoptees, but it is not exclusively Korean American adoptees. Um, and it is a place for us to uh, get together and process through. There's a lot of writing workshops. There's a lot of like um, documentaries and, and sort of panel discussions um, sometimes it's just a social setting. Sometimes we'll all just like get together and go to a Korean restaurant, <laughs> um, which is like a whole event. If, if, if you've never done that with a bunch of other Korean people, it can be kind of nerve wracking because you're like sort of hiding in plain sight. So it's really comforting for all of us to just go there and, and like not know anything together or to try to learn together. It's just, it is like super comfortable, um, mm -hmm. to have faces that look like your faces who also don't know what's happening. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, also known as, I also took a Korean class through also known as, that was incredibly affordable. Um, and it was, uh, again, like a super comfortable experience to be inside of a Korean class with a bunch of other Korean people who also don't know Korean. Because, you know, there's like that feeling of obligation of like, why don't I already know this? I should already know this. And it's sort of a shame-based experience, but this was the opposite. It was very sort of like celebratory and wonderful. Um, so I just always like to um, put their name out there because I found it to be so helpful and so useful. Um, and everybody is so lovely inside the organization. Um, so if anybody out there is interested in this, uh, it's a great it's a great resource. Thank you. Do you remember at what age you started to feel um, like, oh, maybe I should know this or I want to have a more of a connection with my culture? Do, uh, when yeah. did it click for you that I might want to know more about me? Yeah, I guess I would say um, college. College is a pretty um, standard, I think, like adoptee experience because, you know, when you're a kid, like everybody knows your parents. You're sort of under the jurisdiction of your of your adults, you know. Um, and then when you get to college, it's sort of the first time that you're functioning as as an as a as an individual person and, and they it, no one is required to like know your adults. Um, so that's sort of the that's sort of the first time when when assumption a lot of assumptions are being made, most good and bad. Like it was a lot of for me, it was a lot of assumptions made by other Asian Americans about the ex my ex lived experience, which I just didn't have. Um, so that was sort of the beginning sort of 
twist of it. And then when I started working, obviously, I was being asked to, to like play a lot of, uh, you know, ethnicities within the Asian diaspora. And, and, uh, and that also like made me interested. And like I was saying, I was doing Miss Saigon with all these Filipinos who are like so full of like joy and like pride. And, and that made me want to like, you know, see if I could find, I obviously they like enveloped me, fed me, cared for me, loved me. <laughs> so I feel, you know, like raised by Filipinos in some way. <laughs> um, but it did make me interested in like, oh, what, what could this be? Um, and then obviously like within the past, you know, whatever, four or five years, Korean culture is everywhere in this really interesting K way. K-pop, you know, K-pop, all like movies. Um, I feel like food. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like Netflix is just like, there's like K-dramas everywhere. Um, so with that prevalence was like, I mean, the accessibility all of a sudden, like if I want to at any point, I can just turn on Netflix and like watch some, <laughs> watch some K-dramas with everybody, you know, like, and talk to other people about it even is, is just like wild. Um, yeah, so then that, and then also like as I get older and I think about having children, that's another thing that makes me really want to like understand more about my my ethnicity and my heritage. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, you know, in your, in your learning and your discovering and unpacking and, and, you know, getting closer to your Korean roots, uh, which of the performing arts uh, do you feel most attracted to? Uh, you know, is it the dance? Is it singing? Is it, you know, what do you feel is your favorite kind of area of the performing arts from the Korean uh Korean culture? Um, I think the the writing, like the storytelling, mm -hmm. um, movies like Parasite and mm -hmm. um, TV shows like Squid Game. And um, there's like, I'm not going, I'm not like make it, you know, I think it's pretty appropriate to say like Koreans are really obsessed with like revenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think mean, all the Koreans will like back me up here. There's this concept called Han, which is like it's it's um this thought that like all Koreans have this thing, and I became very obsessed with this concept too because I was like, oh, I have a I, do I have a thing? I still have the thing. Like I didn't, I don't even need to do anything. I just have it. Um, and technically, I think technically, what it is is like intergenerational trauma, but it is it is this thing that all Koreans are said to have, which is like this like this like, <laughs> it sounds really dark, but I actually think it's really beautiful. This sort of like deep, like melancholy and like sort of like bitterness and and like the ability to like wait forever for the proper moment for revenge. <laughs> because of the history, the history of the of the country is sort of like steeped in in like, um, you know, colonialism and and all of these wars, not just the Korean War that, you know, the West sort of knows about, but all the rest of the wars <laughs> inside of, of Korea and, you know, sort of within East Asia. And um, and I, what I think what I like to see is so much is how much that narrative is inside of all the um, Korean movies and television shows that I like. Mm. Um, there's like this, just this like, uh, I don't know, this like ferociousness or... Um, it's just like a simmering, like, like, um, oh, this guy's, he's going to wait, but he's going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> like a slow burn. Like a yes. slow burn. Yes. Yeah. And like this sort of, I can watch the character sometimes just be like, that's fine. I'll wait. Like, I'm like, yeah, that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That reminds, there's a book that I read years ago. Um, uh, it, it's a Chinese book. It's called Thick Face, Black Heart. Mm -hmm. And it's a business book. Oh. And it was about basically having that thick face mm. where I'll wait. Yeah. But when it's time, <laughs> it's, it's <on>. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's yeah. something, maybe it is the Han in me, but it really connects to that idea of just like, that's cool. I'll be cool. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and were you about to say something? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I wanted to think of I, kind of segue this into using our voices as artists. And then, you know, a little bit about the critics that get to tell us whether our art is good or not. And I'm speaking specifically of cis male white critics 
in our field because they are the majority of people who get to tell us and tell the public whether our art is good or not. And I know that you spoke out about Paula Vogel's work, who is one of my heroes and, you know, Lynn Nottage's work, again, another queen of writing. And I was wondering if you could kind of unpack how we can encourage women of color to move into the world of critique and to shore up and find strength in being, uh, seeing ourselves reflected in the world of, of critics? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think uh, I'm going to answer the question sort of a securitist, securitist route. Go, but... take, I'll, I'll lean back. I'll lean no. back. Casual. Casual. But, uh, and you lean back and I lean forward. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll stay poised in each other. <laughs> Um, what was it saying? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so Chinese Lady, right, is um, is a show that is designed for predominantly white audience. Mm. Like it's written as it's supposed to be a woman, a, a Chinese woman in 1834 speaking to uh, like white Western audience. And because of the way that theater is, for most for the most part, if you're doing if you're doing that show in America, it's going to be that anyway, right? And it's interesting if there if there is a show where like there are a lot of people of color in the audience, then it, it just is a different show. Um, so anyway, the point being that this show has really taught me when I started doing it in 2018, I felt this like feeling of if they don't get it, if I don't change every single person's heart, hearts and minds, like then I've d I have failed. I have failed. Like I didn't do it right. I, and I had sort of this feeling of it was up to me to like change racism for good, right? And um, the more that time went on, the more I just let go of that. <laughs> so everybody after a while was asking me like, how do you do the show? It's so heavy. It's, you know, how are you managing? Um, and I gave them, I think, a really unsatisfying answer of just that I don't care. I actually don't care. Because um, it isn't actually, I don't think anyway, at least from my point of view, my job is to go on stage and perform to the best of my ability the show that our team has agreed on. You know what I mean? I can make my choices as an, as an actor, but other people are also making choices. And we're, we've collaborated into, you know, we've collaborate, collaborated and made this piece that we are all presenting on stage. And, um, and that's my job, is to just go and, and do the job that my team has decided. It's not actually my job to make someone in the audience see me as a whole person because I am a whole person just full stop I don't actually need to like push and prove that to you I'm going to present to you my reality or the reality of the show and that is enough for me and I understand it is tricky because you know these like uh these critics are gatekeeping right and we have to care to some extent about what they think however <laughs> I just, I'm going to bring up my partner and I asked her if I could. Um, my partner is uh, an incredible theater maker, multi-hyphenate, incredible, incredible uh, person. Um, her name is Nikki Douglas and she is a black creator. And she has like been so sort of fundamental to me changing my thought process because I think, I'm going to say this very carefully, I think a lot of the time within the Asian American community, because of the proximity to the white community, there's a lot of concern for what the white audience will think without any thought, I think, to like what the black audience might think, what a Latino audience might think. There's a lot of like just a one way street of exchange, I think, um, that I am interested in. I know it won't ever go away entirely, but I'm interested for sure in opening it up. I think the Asian American community sort of exclusively talks to the white community and I want the Asian American community to talk to everybody because we've definitely had this conversation. We've had like a, a white and Asian conversation. I haven't seen that many like black and Asian conversations, not really. Um, and that's, you know, or like, what about like a bunch of Korean people talking to a bunch of Mexican people? Let's try that. Like, what is that conversation? Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, Nikki makes work uh, for black women and she sort of, that's her focus. She's like, I actually don't care what anybody else is thinking, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I think, you know, it's been so inspirational. It's wonderful to be around someone who just, this is what I'm making. This is who it's for. Mm -hmm. And that's enough. That is actually enough. And if, if, a, if a, like a white critic doesn't think it's enough, that actually doesn't matter. I have made the thing. It's already there. You know, you, you saying that brings up a couple of different thoughts for me. One, <clears throat> unfortunately, I can't think of her last name, but a woman named Maya, who is a critic at large at the Phillips. New York Times. Thank you, Maya yeah. Phillips. It um, makes me think about her and the position that she's in and totally. the question that Anne is asking. And hopefully if there are any young um, artists or young theater lovers out there that are listening, that they really do consider going into the spaces of being a critic because they are gatekeepers. And we as artists, <clears throat> we really cannot care, like you're saying, about what the critic is going to say. We cannot perform for the critic. We have to perform the truth of the story that we're telling. However, some people don't have the capacity to really understand that truth. And because they don't understand it or it doesn't speak to their reality, they then deem it as something that's not worthy of other people seeing. Totally. So I do really hope that people listening consider to go in, going into those spaces. And you mentioned something um, about performing um, for white audiences, right? I did a production of um, Aubergine and I was the one black person in the show. Well, no, there was, <laughs> there was, there was another, I'm sorry. The, the nurse was also black. Um, but everybody else were, were Korean and we started having those conversations about what if there was a show that did have the conversations between the black experience and the Asian experience. And especially at this, in this climate, yeah. what would that look like? And what would that be like? So if there are writers out there, get on it. Cause know. you know, we're ready for it. Shannon's ready for it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Anne's ready for it. <laughs> I'm ready. Yes. I'm ready. Absolutely. You know, Oh, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to say just a little tiny thing. You know, there are these plays, beautiful plays like Kim's Convenience and, you know, that that dig deep into that Asian Black relationship. But I think it's done through the white gaze. You know, the humor in that show is beautiful and I laugh a lot. But I was just asked to come in as a cultural uh, coordinator on uh, a production that's happening uh, very soon in Los Angeles. And there are a couple of scenes that dig down deep into the in the rift between Black people and Asian people, simply because through the white gaze, Asian people are good immigrants and Black people are bad immigrants. And it kind of unpacks all of that in a very humorous way, but it's done for a white audience. And I, you know, just like Joy is very interested and wiping away kind of the white gaze and actually getting to the good parts. The fact that Korean people and black people love fried chicken. Can we talk about it? <laughs> Can we talk Absolutely. about their delicious? Yes. You know, the fact that Asian people <laughs> and black people have very, very common child rearing experiences. Absolutely. You know, um, there's so many commonalities that I think whiteness has driven a wedge between us in order to control us. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I just think like Joy does that there's just such an interesting conversation to be had if we can decenter the whiteness in our relationship as people. Absolutely. And everybody absolutely. will benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to I just want to like uh, piggyback off what you were saying, just to like underline this for the for the Asian people listening. I just truly it is a model minority myth. It's a myth. Mm. It's a tool for white supremacy. And it's not a and I just want to clarify this, too, because I think sometimes people hear and say it's very carefully again, they hear white supremacy and they think that we are what we're saying is white people. Right. But you don't have to be white to be a white supremacist. We're talking about white supremacy. We're talking about like a mindset, you know, and uh, and that's what we're trying to decenter is just the the concept that like 
whiteness is sort of the baseline or like that white is quote unquote like regular. It doesn't always have to, that doesn't have to be where we start from all the time. You better tell him, Shannon. (laughs) Yes. So Shannon, in terms of your vision for yourself, right? Um, Do you, you, when you described your partner, you talked about her being a multi-hyphenate and, um, and you said it with so much passion and love. So do you just see, now I, you've gone from acting to directing. Do you see yourself as a multi-hyphenate? Do you see your, what other things are coming after that hyphen and the next one and the next one and the next one? I don't begrudge people who, I don't even know that Nikki would call herself a multi-hyphenate, but I don't begrudge people that are multi-hyphenates. But personally, like, I think that I am an actor and then I do a bunch of other things. I don't necessarily think I'm putting them on par with each other. Um, So I wouldn't, I don't know. If anything, I'm using commas, not hyphens. (laughs) Um, But uh, I do write. I I, um, have a couple of writing partners and we're working on um, writing some things. I would love to direct some more. I also, I have a love for musical theater still. So like I still sing and and do concerts and things. Um, I'm always sort of more interested in that. There's like just a really wonderful crop of of, uh, Asian American musical theater writers that I'm super like invested in seeing where this goes because of my love for, (laughs) my baseline love for Miss Saigon. I just love musicals and I just think that we deserve, you know, not a Miss Saigon, but the same sort of like weight behind it. Yeah. Would be would be terrific, I think. Mm. Um, does that answer? I don't know. It's tough talking about that. I feel um, embarrassed talking about well, it. Well, I'm going to get real tough. I'm going to get real <laughs> tough. Okay. Um, you know, my work as an intimacy specialist and my work in the field is heavily weighed in self-care. Mm. And as self-care as a tool for longevity in this career, especially for women of color in this Mm -hmm. career. And so I'm gonna ask you, what's your self-care regime? How do you take care of yourself outside of, you know, being in love with a a wonderful woman or a wonderful person? I'm not sure about pronouns. Woman Um, or person is fine, yeah. Okay, and uh, you know, having an enriching career, what do you do to take care of Shannon? Uh, yeah, I seek out nature a lot. Um, and um, I really, this is tough because I should engage more in social media. I sh- quote unquote should um, for for work related purposes, but I really just, I don't want to. It just makes me sad all the time. <laughs> so, uh, so I just never do unless I'm making like a conscious effort. It's like on my to-do list, like update Instagram. Um, <laughs> um, so I honestly, I just like, don't really engage. I don't have a Facebook. I don't have Twitter. I have Instagram. Cause I like going online to like, you know, watch a man make sandwiches or whatever, <laughs> whatever, like stupid Instagram stuff. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I just, um, I, I think I'm a private person. So I, I, um, like to protect that and, and not see it in like a selfish way, but just like a boundary way I think is really useful. Um, and I like to, uh, we sort of, t- I, I can't remember what, when this came up, but it, this idea popped up in my head of, um, how evil, like an algorithm is, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, like everything we have right now, all of our streaming services, there's an algorithm and everything is being curated and sort of like placed in front of you. Um, and you can't even really, it's hard to break it. Like it's hard to break up your Netflix algorithm. You have to really try to seek out stuff that is not like being, placed in front of you. And um, I think I like to look for things that are like something I would not usually engage with. Does that make sense? Like, even if I'm like, I think I might hate this, but let me just go and see like what it is. Um, And in terms of like art, I'm not a huge like um, visual art person, but I try all the time to like go see visual art. Um, uh, Dance is as well, like I'm not a huge dancer, but I am like very invested in in going to see um, dance of all kinds, just to see like what it what it shakes up. And it can be sort of a gamble, right? Because you're investing like time and energy and money into something that you might not like, 
but there is, I, I just still think there is something to that, especially like in this industry and being an actor is like sort of so navel gazy all the time and sort of always like thinking about your own stuff. And um, I think it's so useful just to try to try to purposely find something else with, with like strong intention behind it. I love that because what I hear from all of that is growth is your self care. Mm. <laughs> that you're uh, yeah. always looking for new ways to grow. And hence, you know, I like growth. I, 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 was, lo I was loving this. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. mentioned earlier, um, there were other organizations outside of the, also known as, that were very helpful. Please um, share that information for those folks that are listening as well. Thank you so much for coming back to that. Um, so I just always, there's a lot of people, I think um, there's like two types of people with this information. There are um, adult adoptees, and then there are people who are thinking about adopting or considering adopting. Um, and I think these are for both of them. Um, so there's also known as, there's a woman named Angela Tucker, uh, just like um, spelled exactly as you think it would be, um, who is starting something called the Adoptee Mentoring Society. And she's also been a personal, she's become, I think, a friend at this point, but she's also, I worked with her as well. Um, she is a transracial adoptee, um, but she's working on um, building like a not-for-profit that would allow uh, free counseling and like mentorship for adoptees. So that's in development. She'll be launching it very, very soon. Um, there's a wonderful podcast by a woman named Haley Radke called Adoptees On. And I love podcasts because it's free. It's just like free information and not everybody is a reader, right? Um, so I love, I just always love a podcast recommendation. Um, and she is an adult adoptee and, and focuses exclusively on adult adoptees. And she's very good about like allowing all narratives into the, into the space about adoption. Um, there's on Instagram, there's Adoptees for Justice, the number four. Um, and I also follow someone named Cam Lee Small um, on Instagram, who is also, he is an adult adoptee. And he um, he has a really interesting uh, angle in that he is a religious person and he, and a lot of adoption sort of um, is based, there's a large part of adoption that is based inside of religion and the idea of it being a religious sort of practice for lack of a better word. And he's he's really wonderful about addressing that with love and with reality, which I really appreciate on his part. Um, and then the other thing I always recommend to everybody is the Kung Fu Panda trilogy. Those movies with, Jack, those animated movies with Jack Black, I think are like the finest. <laughs> if you have a, an adopted child or, or if you are an adult adoptee, or I just think like the point of view on that is, that, is absolutely brilliant. Also, they're like adorable movies, but um, especially the third one, they really get into this, <laughs> They really get into what um, uh, adoption is and, and first families, also known as birth families and adopted families and, and what their relationship is to each other in this really beautiful way. So I just I just flat out recommend that to everybody all the time. <laughs> so from um, your experience and your experience with um, your counterparts that you go out with and, and partake in different Korean cultural things together with, um, from the conversations, do you find that generally it is healthier to, or more helpful to introduce your adopted child, your trans international adopted child to their culture earlier or to let them adjust to where they are mm -hmm. and then introduce them? Like, what do you, from the experience of that you've had in your organization talking with people, what's the best thing for generally, because mm -hmm. there's no one answer, Right. Um, the best thing for a parent to do? Yeah, this is a really tricky question, right? Because I think the idea is that you don't wanna alienate your child by making them feel different, right? And I think that's the, that's the basis. It is with love, this concept that I will not bring up this thing about my child, but I also do, I understand that it comes from a place of love, but I also think honestly and with love from me that that is sort of um, a, a white supremacist notion that a race in America doesn't matter. And if I have a child who is of a different race than I am, especially you know if the child is a, is a child of color, that it's fine. 
Like they are under my umbrella of care and I love them and I believe there is love there and that my love is simply enough. And I, and I do not believe that to be the case. Um, so I honestly don't think, and I also, I guess it, it depends on the situation and everything, but I just don't ever think, you know, that conversation is like, when is it too early to talk to your child about racism and race? Um, I think it sort of lines up with that. Like, I don't think there's ever a time it, that would be too early to introduce your child to their own <laughs> heritage. And I also think one step further, it is never like you should have done it yesterday if you are a family who is a Western family and adopting from a, a different country. Yesterday is the time that you yourself as, a, as an adopted parent should, should be investing in where your child comes from. It's not up to the child to like solely be, you know, carry on the legacy of their heritage what a wonderful idea that like I'm welcoming someone into my home who is different than I am. And that's not a shameful thing. That's something to be embraced and, and um, you know, celebrated. Uh, it's celebrated. Yeah. And it's, um, it's not a dirty secret. It's, and everybody can see it anyway. You know, it's like, we can see that that child is a different race right, than like, you are. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you can, you know, you can see, they can see it's, it's not a secret. And, um, and I think uh, it's a really wonderful concept too of like, um, you know, say I say I adopted um, a child who is from a Spanish speaking country. Like, why would I not learn some Spanish too? You know what I mean? Like, why not? Well, that's um, my next question yeah. is, yeah. are there any ideas or interest in you adopting in the future? Uh, no, I actually, um, I feel very complicated about adoption as a practice. I don't think it's ever going to stop. But I think there are many ways that it can be um, changed to focus more on the fact that the narrative as it is right now is that adoption is a joyful event. The, the actual truth of the adoption is that for the child, it starts inside of a very traumatic event. And for right. the first family and the birth family, that is a deeply traumatic event. And to sort of gloss over that concept I think it, it does, it's not, um, it's, I don't think it's the correct personally, and I will say blanketly, <laughs> um, I just don't think it is healthy to ignore that part of the beginning of your life. The, or if that is your origin story, that's something to be dealt with. It's a, it's a, it is an, it's not a non-event. <laughs> right. Um, and, you yeah. know, we're living in a very Eurocentric capitalist results and results world in mm -hmm. this country, you know, where, oh, let's just forget about what happened back then, slavery, and mm -hmm. let's like focus on what's happening now. Let's exactly. focus on the fact that you can own a home or that you can do this and this with, you know, without all the trauma that's heaped on top of that. And I think if we can get back to, you know, roots that are less white, that we will understand that life is a process and that every single stage of life deserves its own time and respect, <laughs> that the adoption process might be a little bit uh, less traumatic. But if we, if we deny the fact that a person is being removed from their home, whatever the situation is in that home, and given these bright, shiny toys and a brand new bicycle and all of that, you know, my, my sister is adopted. <laughs> so I have a sister who is adopted and, um, you know, the process of her adoption, although she was very, very young, it was very much like that. She was mm -hmm. taken out of a, a home that was not healthy and put into this upper middle class existence without the discussion of the travel from there to where she was. So mm -hmm. I, I love that you that you can illuminate that and that you bring that forward, mm -hmm. uh, that it's not always pie in the sky experience for the child or for the first family. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I really do like you bringing, bringing that up, Shannon, because that's actually something I've never considered or thought about in the sense of <clears throat> I have domestically, um, I too have adopted sisters. I have three, um, but it's a domestic experience. Mm -hmm. It's not an international experience. And so that's a whole cultural change. It's a whole um, different sense of identity. And like what you mentioned earlier, when you talked about the model minority, um, it, it, it 
actually sets that person up to really have a colonized mindset Absolutely. if it has not been addressed earlier, which then puts them in a internal struggle with themselves as they get older. I never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's, uh, that's, I mean, I'm, a, I feel like I had a good day. Like if, uh, if all I can do is, um, you know, if, if recording this and talking to you has, um, allowed you or some other people to just have a, have a, a new idea about adoption. I think that is, that is like the first step to, to opening up the experience to what it potentially could be for sure. Yes. So thank you so much for sharing your time, sharing your truth, sharing your talent with all of us. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. I look forward to hearing much, much more about your success in the future. And um, please stay in touch with us. So thank, thank you so again. much. This is really wonderful. Yes. Such a yes. pleasure. Such a pleasure to meet you. So for Same. those who came in in the middle, we were talking with Shannon Tayo, and um, she is an outstanding lead performer, or was an outstanding lead performer in the Mai production of Chinese Lady, and a recipient of the Sova's um, Award for Best Teen Narration for The Girl from the Sea, and has an upcoming production that she will be directing of The Chinese Lady as well. So again, thank you, and Shannon. And a recipient of the Lortel. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Maybe you won a Lord Tell Award now. <laughs> so thank you again. Um, we ask that all of you um, get back to the theater. It is very, very important that we support theater. Mm -hmm. Stay safe out there. Keep mm -hmm. love in your heart. Have a wonderful summer. And when you see someone that is in distress, just give them a smile if you can't do anything else. Um, thank you so much. We love you all and we look forward to seeing you in the next season. <laughs>